all the hunters up in the north of Wawa area. Skip's up there hunting. We should pray for them. Now's your chance. <laughs> going, going, gone. You've got to stay here. Please turn with me in your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 6. I appreciated uh, Frank's uh, testimony this morning. That was uh, very impromptu. Vince was down to open this morning. And uh, it's nice to hear it come from the heart. And uh, it reminds me that Christianity really isn't just coming to church, is it? Most of uh, Christianity for us is uh, all those 24 hours a day we spend away from here every day of the week. And it... uh, it consists of uh, the inner spiritual struggles that we all have, our relationships out there, and uh, just our walk with the Lord personally. And uh, that's why this theme of holiness has really impressed itself upon me, and that's why I've been speaking on this same theme for several weeks. It's because there are a multitude of topics available to uh, preachers and teachers of God's Word to speak on, and they're all important. And I don't want to leave the impression that anything in God's Word isn't important. Uh, Sometimes it's necessary to talk about giving. Sometimes it's necessary to talk about church leaders or how the church runs or the spiritual gifts and, and how we all have a function in the body of Christ and how we're to work together. It's important to talk about uh, the world and our relationship to the world. But underlying all of those things is this uh, very frequently unmentioned reality that in everything, we stand alone with our Maker. Every one of us as individuals stands like this with God. And He is watching what you do what I am doing every day of the week. Uh, He knows our thoughts. He is evaluating our spiritual temperature, as it were. He's like a nurse hovering over this weak little creature that constantly gets into trouble. And uh, He's there. And someday we're going to stand face to face before Him and we are going to answer. And the thing that needs to be emphasized, and that is behind why I'm speaking on this subject, is that it doesn't matter what other people see from you. It does, but in reality it doesn't. It's not so much what you do, but it's more important that you walk spiritually, inwardly with God. It's very important what you are. It's very important what I am. You can, pool, you can fool some of the people some of the time, and you can fool some of the people all of the time, but you can't fool God. And holiness has to do with me and God, with you and God. Over the past uh, two or three weeks, we have looked at this subject from a couple of different angles. We've looked at what Jesus said about holiness. And if there's anything I think that stands in our minds that probably all of us is very familiar with, it's the reality that when Jesus lived in this world 2,000 years ago, He came head to head with the religious leaders of His day on the subject of holiness. The Pharisees did everything in their power, like other people in the Jewish society, to make it appear as if they were holy. And their entire emphasis was on the external how people are seeing me and what I do outwardly, and they would stand off from the offering plate in the temple and throw their money in so it would make a great big noise so people could see them clanging their gold coins into the offering. 
you know, and they put bells on their clothes, like we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, so that people's attention would be drawn to them as they walk through the marketplace and these extra holy people. And we've got them running around in North America today. They've imported them since the 60s from India. You know, these holy men, these yogis, these, uh, these people that purport to have a very special holy relationship with God, and they wear these distinctive clothes, and everybody's drawn to them. And it's external. Jesus condemned external righteousness of man, and He taught that true holiness is something that springs from the heart and then shows itself externally. We also looked a couple of weeks ago, maybe it was last week, at what John said about holiness. John was Jesus' closest, most intimate friend when he lived in this world 2,000 years ago. And if anybody knew what Jesus really thought was important, I'm sure it was John. John is like this with Jesus on the subject of holiness. There are two types, you know, there are people in the world and there are people that walk with God. And John stressed, uh, stresses in his writings that holiness is an indispensable, it's a crucial commodity. If we don't have it, things are all screwed up in our lives as Christians. Our fruitfulness depends on holiness. Our fellowship, our friendship with God, even our feelings. Did you know that? Even your feelings as a child of God is depending on whether or not you are a holy Christian like you should be. We're all Christians if we've put our faith in Christ, but not all Christians are becoming um, <coughs> like their father who is absolutely perfect. Some Christians are becoming more like the devil rather than like the father. Our feelings. God says in the book of First John that you can have assurance. Your feelings depend on whether or not you live right. Now this morning we're going to turn our attention to the subject of holiness from another one of the scripture writers. And that's the Apostle Paul. Of the 200 or so New Testament references to words like holy or holiness or sanctification or righteousness and so forth. And there's lots of other words that I didn't look up for this study, but there are well over 200 words on this subject in the New Testament. Over half of those references are made by Paul. And I heard one time someone was complaining about, oh, how come you have to spend so much time talking about Timothy and Romans and 1 Corinthians and all those books in the New Testament? Some people get tired of listening to the Pauline epistles preached. Well, that's like uh, taking the pumpkin out of a pumpkin pie. You know, you don't have much left if you take the pumpkin out of a pumpkin pie. You know, you don't have really a whole lot left of the New Testament if you take Paul out of the New Testament. You see, God's Spirit has seen fit in the past to move certain of the apostles to write things down and they were moved by the Holy Spirit it says and uh, I think the reason some people don't like Paul is because Paul just cuts it straight he just tells it like it is if there's anybody that talks about holiness it's Paul some people don't like that because they don't want to consider personal holiness there's three things that I'd like to share with you this morning about the subject of holiness according to Paul first of all in no uncertain terms, Paul commands holiness from God's people. In other words, do it. Live it. You don't have an option if you're a child of God. You better be doing it. Secondly, he gives us the good reasons why. And thirdly, and most importantly, like none of the other scripture writers, Paul tells us how. Right? So he says we ought to be doing it. He's going to give us a number of reasons why, and most importantly, he tells us how to do it. Now, there's a great danger in preaching, and that is that you can teach people this is what you should be doing, and this is, you know, this is the way you're to be, and God's Word holds up these wonderful standards, but if the preacher doesn't go ahead and make it plain as to what you're to do with what he's talking about, then he's kind of built you up and left you hanging and you're sitting there gasping for breath and wondering, scratching your head, you know, okay, so what? 
Well, on this subject, there is, you know, you don't have to worry. The, the Bible is plain as can be on what we should be doing about this business of holiness. And I think that uh, we are going to be brought again this morning face to face with a tremendous issue that confronts every one of us. It confronts me every morning just like it confronts you. And that is, am I willing to do right? Am I willing to please God or do I really want my own way today? That's the issue. Please follow with me through the Scriptures to see just how emphatic the Apostle Paul is on the subject of doing right. It's not an option. There are admonitions, there are imperatives, there are suggestions, there are encouragements galore. I asked you to turn to Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> Let's read verses 11 to 13. Likewise reckon or consider ye also yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but yield yourselves to God as those that are alive from the dead, and yield your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. How much plainer can it be? Those are imperatives there. God doesn't come along through Paul and say, you know, it might be a good idea if you would consider being a nice person. <laughs> you know, it's not an option, it's an imperative. Verse 20, uh, verse 19 in the same chapter, I speak... Paul says, after the manner of men because of the infirmity or weakness of your flesh. For just as you have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity and to iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness and to holiness. Verse 22, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. And Greek scholars, some Greek scholars think that verse 22 ought to be translated as an imperative, not, not the idea that you are having your fruit under holiness, but it's another challenge. Have your fruit unto holiness. We're in the book of Romans. Turn over to chapter 12 and verse 1. And I don't have to be, you know, I, I don't want to be profound this morning. I want to be simple. I'm not going to elaborate on these verses too much. I just want you to see the weight of God's Word this morning on this subject. I beseech you therefore, brethren. Now Paul is requesting here. He's, he's arguing on the basis of, you know, God has done great things for you. Now think about this. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. And the first word he uses to describe the sacrifice is holy, acceptable unto God. You know what Paul is thinking? Paul is writing to some Jews, some Romans. Back in the Roman days, um, just as in uh, Israel, there were all kinds of pagan religions and they offered up animal sacrifices. Even the Romans did. Uh, one of their favorite uh, ways of de divining the future was to cut a bird in half and to read its innards. And uh, the Jews uh, didn't practice those gory uh, practices like that. But Moses, ever since Moses, they had been told by God to offer up sacrifices, right? What kind of sacrifices would God allow? You know, they couldn't just bring, you know, the 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 last uh, ewe of the flock that was just about ready to collapse. They couldn't bring some little goat that had been mangled by a lion and was going to die anyway. You know, they couldn't bring something that had sores all over its body; its hair was falling out. No, they had to bring the best. Always the best to God. Had to be pure, without blame, without spot, without blemish. You read Leviticus, you see that. 
Well, Paul is writing to Christians. He says, now, you people are like sacrifices. And if there's anything that ought to make sense in the Christian life, it ought to be that because of the wonderful things that God has done for us, we should consider ourselves nothing more than a sacrifice to God. But when you give yourself to God, it better be a holy one, a holy and acceptable sacrifice unto God, which is your reasonable service. Let's move to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And I can see by the passing of time that we're not going to get through all of these references this morning, so we will have to leave some of these. But I want to read some major passages as to where Paul challenges us to live right. Verse 14, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Well, maybe we should just start reading from verse uh, 3, and we'll skip down. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. But in all things, commending ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience and afflictions and necessities and distresses. Verse 6, by pureness. Verse 7, by the word of truth. By the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. And so forth. Verse 14, now to the Corinthian church, he says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now this is the cost of holiness. For what fellowship does righteousness have with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has he that believes with an unbeliever, an infidel? And what agreement has the temple of God on the one hand with idols? You are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. I will receive you. I will be a father to you. You shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. It doesn't take much reading and meditating and thought on these verses to see that Paul saw the Christian life in black and white terms. The young people on Friday nights have been... Uh, have begun a survey of, the, of parts of the New Testament written by Paul. We started in the book of Romans. And uh, the college boys, uh, we have just finished 1 Corinthians. And we were studying 1 Corinthians. And uh, when you understand what kind of a place Corinth was, the words in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 just flash like a neon light. You know what Corinth was like? It was like Los Angeles today. It was like Toronto. Right? Corinth was a major, it was one of the most important towns in the Roman Empire. It was a trade center, a commerce and trade center. And it, it was situated below a, a huge bluff that was about 2,000 feet above sea level. It was a tremendous mountain behind the town. On top of that mountain, there, the cult of Aphrodite had set up a temple. And, uh, of course, that doesn't mean anything to you until you realize that, the, that Aphrodite was the goddess of fertility and love. And to worship the goddess of fertility and love, you joined yourself with a prostitute. And so there were 1,000 religious priestesses that lived and plied their trade on this, in this temple at Corinth. And that's what kind of a city Corinth was. And these Corinthian people had come out of that and they were still living in it and they were coming to church on Sunday and worshiping God and then on Saturday and on Monday and on Tuesday and whenever they felt like it, they were going up and worshiping Aphrodite and they didn't see any difference. Paul was horrified. He writes this letter to them and says, how in the world can you worship God and demons at the same time? Isn't there a difference? How can you fellowship with God and with Satan at the same time. How can you go with true believers and then with unbelievers? Make a difference. Come out from among these people. Separate yourselves. 
And you know the same thing's happening today? Maybe we haven't gone to bed with some religious prostitute. But Paul says in the first verse of the seventh chapter that filthiness isn't merely fleshly, it's spiritual. He says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. The things that most of us would never even consider doing physically, we just revel in mentally. We love to watch the movies. We love to read the books and, wa and look at pictures. And we love to listen to the jokes. You know? And we love to fill our minds with the filth of this world. And we're unwilling to separate it from it. And our spirits are garbage cans. Paul comes right out. He says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. Don't turn to them. I'll just read some of these statements. Put on the new man, he says, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. 2 Timothy 2.22 Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness. Ephesians 6.1 Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. It's a matter of holiness. It's an issue of holiness. Titus 2.12 the, the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age. 1 Corinthians 15.34 Awake to righteousness and sin not. Titus 1, seven and 8 A bishop must be blameless, just, and holy. Well, those are some of the challenges that Paul tells Christians. And, and uh, <clears throat> it's, to me, I think it's uh, an essential. I, I can't see how a, a person can name the name of Christ and think that this does not matter. How can you think that it's just something that preachers harp on and that it doesn't relate to you? The Apostle Paul uses all kinds of personal pictures. He describes Christians as vessels and we are either to honor or dishonor. He describes Christians as temples. We're either holy temples, that is, all spick and span, or we've got graffiti on the walls. We are either sacrifices that are blameless or rotten in God's sight. We are either like brides at the altar that have a white gown on that represents genuine purity, or we are like brides at the altar that have polluted ourselves all our lives and we're putting on a show. Those are the pictures that Paul uses to describe Christians. Romans chapter 6, we read that. He says our bodily members are like instruments. They're like tools is the Greek word. You can take your tool case out and you can kill somebody with a wrench or you can use it to do something good. All right? What are you going to do with your tools? The Scriptures tell us to use our tools, to use our vessels, to use our temples, to use our persons unto holiness. It matters. Paul does, just doesn't tell us that we should do it. He tells us why. And basically, to sum it all up, the reason we should live like this is because that's God's will. That's why He saved us. A few weeks ago, we, we did a study on Romans chapter 8, verse 29, that God has saved us with a holy calling so that we would be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Picture Jesus doing the things you do, having the thoughts you do, watching the movies you do, listening to the music you do, reading the things you do, going to places you do, having the friends you do. Can you picture Jesus living like yourself? And if you can't, if there's anything that you would feel a rub of friction, cut it off. Become holy. The reason we should do it, you don't have to take my word for it. Let's look at a few of these references. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. He starts in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as He has chosen us in Him, that is, in Christ, even before the foundation of the world for this purpose. And what purpose is that? Why has God chosen you and me? 
that we should be holy and without blame before Him. You notice it's not before our peers. It's not according to other people's standards, but before Him. Before Him. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And He gave Himself for it, for this purpose. Why did Christ die for us? That He might sanctify and cleanse the church with the washing of water by the Word. This, for this further purpose, that He might ultimately present it to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Colossians chapter 1, verse 22. Verse 21 says, You that were one time alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has He reconciled. Jesus went to the cross to change us. He reconciled us in the body of His flesh through death for this purpose, ultimately to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. Notice again, in his sight. Drive that into your mind. Why should I be right? Why should I change my lifestyle? Why should I give up the things that I love to do that I know are not right? Why? Because I stand in the presence of a holy God with whom I deal. And we, you can fool some of the people. You can fool the preacher. You can come to church on Sunday morning and look nice and talk nice and act nice. But what does God think of you? It's not, that's not the issue, not what I think of you and what other Christians think of you, but what does God think of you? What does He think of me? I stand in His sight. I live before Him. As Paul said, in Him we live and move and have our being. Do we really believe that? I think some Christians don't have much faith. They don't really believe in God because it doesn't matter how they live. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Paul prays in verses uh, 10 through 13. It says, Night and day praying exceedingly for you Christians. And this is what he prays for, verse 12. The Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men even as we do toward you to the end. And this is what, you know, the Holy Spirit has seen fit to record these prayers because we learn God's will from these things to the end that God may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. There you have it again. Before God, even our Father, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with His saints. Have you ever uh, been watching television and somebody drove up? First thing you did was you run to the TV and you turn the television on. Then you look out the window to see who came in. Or you're listening to the radio. Right? Same thing. You know. That's the, uh, the kind of feeling multiplied by a million times that a lot of us are going to have when Jesus Christ comes back into this world. Oh, we're not going to have time to turn the TV on. He's going to catch us. How much better it would be for us to turn it off today and leave it on. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I said that holiness was God's will. Keep reading. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, verse 1, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. Verse 3, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that means setting apart from sin to righteousness, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of sensuality, even as the Gentiles who know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, not just sex, that's what he's talking about, but in any matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God has not called us to uncleanness, but unto holiness. How much plainer can it get? Why should we live right? Why should we clean up our act as Christians? Because that's why God saved us. He calls us to holiness, and that's His will. 
that we would continually be in the process of becoming better and better people. We're supposed to be lights. Some of us are one watt. Some of us are point zero zero one milliwatts. Some of us are ten watts. Where are you? What kind of a light? I think a lot of us are like lights on a hill and we've got a hat on our heads and nobody can see the light. Well, those are some of the reasons why it might be uh, interesting to, um, to think about the testimony that we could have. You know, it probably would surprise you, as it probably would surprise me to know the number of people that are really seriously watching you to see what kind of a person you are. A uh, very famous uh, preacher was um, from England, Robert Murray McShane. Maybe he was from Scotland. And when he died, uh, a letter was found locked in his desk that he had never shown to anyone. And in this letter uh, were the words, um, or it was a testimony that someone had been watching this man and had come to salvation through watching this, this preacher. And quote, this is what the letter said. It was nothing you said that made me wish to be a Christian. It was rather the beauty of holiness which I saw in your face. In the first century, Christians were being tremendously attacked all over the Roman world. And one pagan writer, with admiration, said that there, is, there are no women like the Christian women. In other words, they stood out so differently from the pagan women that it was a remarkable testimony. Uh, I've come across people that surprised me that said they were watching me before. And, uh, boy, does that ever sober you up in a hurry when you know that people are watching you? Yeah. And if we would just realize we shouldn't be doing this only for other people, we should be doing it for the Lord because He's ultimately the one that we have to answer to. But... You know, this is also an issue involved. Why should we live right? Because God wills it. Because that's why we're saved in the first place. And thirdly, because other people are watching us. How? How do you live right? Well, let me give you four steps this morning. And any one of these will lead you to success. You don't have to go all through all four of them. Uh, sometimes one is more appropriate than another. Every one of these steps comes from Paul. And he was interested, he was concerned that the Christians to whom he wrote would actually make a difference in their lives. The first thing I think we have to see is that God's Word is crucial. We have to think God's thoughts after Him. And that's where literature and language is so important. If God didn't want us to think like Him and to be holy, then He wouldn't have given us anything to think about. Right? But since He has revealed His Word, then obviously He wants us to learn it, to meditate on it. He's told us that. To memorize it, to put it in our heads. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against Thee. And consequently, that will transform our thinking. It will change the way we look at life if we get into God's Word. Second Timothy chapter 3. And verses 16 and 17, those so familiar verses from the Apostle Paul. He says, all Scripture, not just my writings, but all of God's recorded Word is given by the mouth of God and it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction. And note carefully the last phrase in verse 16. It is profitable for instruction in righteousness. If you want to know how to live right, do what I've done this morning. You don't, it doesn't ha you don't have to know Hebrew and Greek to be able to learn something from God's Word. Right? Open your Bible and flip a few pages and read. The Word of God will teach you how to be righteous in order that, ultimately, that the man and woman of God may be perfect, thoroughly prepared unto all good works. You've got to think God's thoughts after Him. Ephesians 5.25, which we read a few moments ago, said that Jesus Christ is sanctifying us, the church, His bride, by the washing of water by the Word. The Word of God is crucial to changing your life and making you a better person. And for me, Jesus taught in His prayer, 
to the disciples, recorded in John 17, he says, he said to the Father, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. If you, if you go on your ideas, you'll always be led astray. If you go on dreams, you'll be led astray. If you go by other people's ideas, you'll be led astray. If you go by TV, you'll be led astray. You know, Chatelaine, you'll be led astray. Your high school counselor, you will be led astray. You don't depend on other people. You depend on the Lord's Word, ultimately, for everything. Secondly, if you want to be right, this is how you do it. Obey. Obey. Now, you're going to say, but that's what I can't do. I can't obey. It's too hard. Well, if you're a Christian, you have the power within you to obey. God's Word declares that you do. All right? It's a simple matter of choice. Let's go back to Romans 6:16 6, for a moment. Romans chapter 6 verse 16. Paul asked a question of these Roman Christians. Do you not know that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey? His servants you are, whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. We have a story that we teach our kids about Ipsy and Newman. And uh, it's like the black dog and the white dog inside the Indian boy's heart, you know. And it's whoever he says stick him to that wins. Okay, well that's basically what Paul is saying. He says, look it, you got a choice. Every one of us have a choice. Don't you know that whoever you yield to becomes your master? And that's all basically obeying in, consists of. It means yielding to somebody. And we are, every Christian is just pounded to death every day with pressures to do this and to do that. And everybody's just thumbing us, you know, you know, trying to force us into their mold, into their way. Okay? So most of us, like people in the world, are, are built so that, well, what we usually do is we yield to the strongest pressure. We just can't bear the thought of being humiliated before our school friends, and so we yield, and we obey them instead of God. Or the guys at work. We just can't bear the thought of being humiliated and scorned at by the guys at work. So we will yield to their pressures. That's as simple, that's, it's, that's ex simple as it gets. If you want to win, you've got to yield to the right person. God lives within. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And every one of us is a slave to some outside pressure. Right? And it's, it all depends on who we yield to. Go to chapter 8, where Paul talks about the same thing. We're still talking about obedience. Of, the obedience of faith is the key to, to being victorious. Verse 3 and 4, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, and that's true about us too, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh for this purpose, that the righteousness of God's law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Look at verse 7. 6 and 7. For to be carnally minded, fleshly minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to God's law, neither indeed can it be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. He's talking about precisely the same thing. If you're going to merely yield to the fleshly pressures that surround you every day, you'll lose. That's called walking after the flesh. But if you as a Christian will mentally recognize that you have God's Spirit living within you, you have the latent power residing in you because God is in you, if you will yield to His control and take the first step and obey, God says He will give you victory. It works. You know, somebody's having a nicotine fit, to use another illustration. All right? And so they are thinking, I gotta yield to that. I, I, I gotta have I gotta have one. Right? And so they yield to that pressure without realizing that they just yielded to a loser. God is the winner, and that nicotine fit is the loser. It's not as strong as God is, but they yielded to that instead of to God. 
And so that's why they lost. All right? And uh, it's the same principle. It's simply a matter of choice. You've got to deal radically with your life. You've got to be willing to really go out on a limb. You've got to really, it's got to, you've got to be serious about this. The Christian cannot accept the fact that man is only a refined animal, someone has said, and that feelings of hostility are all right as long as they are ventilated in a good, fair fight. The world teaches that it's okay to fight and to let your feelings show as long as you don't hurt, you don't go too far. God expects us as His children to put to death, to deal radically with our carnal drives. Paul says we are to put off anger and malice. The Greek expression he uses pictures somebody stripping off a filthy old garment. Henry Vanderloog puts it this way, Dear friend, while open discussion of your irritations has value, the intent must never be to live comfortably with our selfish tendencies. Deal radically with every evil attitude and action, looking to the Savior for help. He's saying the same thing that Paul's saying. That's God's way to overcome your specific problems, whatever, whether it be hostility or a nicotine problem or uh, filthy thoughts or whatever. It means you've got to get serious with it and start yielding to the right master. <clears throat> Thirdly, if you want to become victorious, draw near to God. Philippians chapter 1. And I, I will quit with this because I realize that it's Thanksgiving weekend and some of you have turkey on the brain right now. Philippians chapter 1. Verses 9 through 11. Paul says, This I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and all judgment. I pray that you may approve things that are excellent that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory of and praise of God. You notice that verse 11? Unto the, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ. Every one of us is like uh, a bunch of... Uh, little sparrows that haven't learned to fly yet and we're all in a big nest as it were and we are totally dependent for everything on somebody coming in and dropping something into our mouth right we're helpless and we can't we can't even believe in God unless God gives us faith we can't even begin to want to do good things until God puts the desire in the same book Paul said it's God that works in you both to will and then to do of His good pleasure. We don't even have the desires. We're dependent on God for everything. And when you talk about holiness, don't you go out of here this morning thinking, okay, i got to pull up my socks, and I'm going to start living better. I'm going to drop off these habits. I'm going to do better. You can't do it. If you go out of, there with, out of here with that attitude, you miss this point. This point is a crucial point, that it is God who causes the fruit to grow out of your life. It's Jesus Christ. It's the Holy Spirit. Other references are Ephesians 5, 9, 2 Corinthians 9, 10, and many more. A story is told about two brothers in England years ago that uh, were going, walking through the business district and uh, the little, little brother uh, saw a bunch of apples in this uh, market and he wanted an apple. But when he got closer, he was drawn to something that really attracted his attention. That was a bunch of thorns, real sharp thorns that the storekeeper had put around the basket of apples to keep people from filching them. Well, his older brother bought him one of the apples, but he wouldn't take the apple without insisting that he could get, couldn't get one of those little thorns. He wanted this thorn, too, so the storekeeper finally gave him one of the thorns, and he went home happy. But his older brother was pretty worried for him because he figured he was going to end up getting a thorn in the eye or something. And so he was looking for some way to uh, distract him and to get this thorn branch away from his little brother. And uh, he tried to talk him out of it, and his little brother would not give up that thorn branch for anything. 
So they were walking a little further on, and they passed the store, and there was a little drum in this window. And his older brother said, uh, would you like that? And he was using pretty good, uh, he was using his head for something here. And his little brother, you know, of course he wanted that little drum, so they went in and they bought it. And, uh, of course, an apple in one hand and a drum and then this thorn stick, um, it was just too much for this little guy to carry. He couldn't carry all of this. His older brother made sure he was doing all the carrying. And finally, of his own free choice, the little boy said, Charlie, here, you hold this. And he passed him the thorn branch. And the illustration is that we as God's people have got to be willing to give up the garbage that this world is polluting our lives with for something that's far better. You can't have them both. You can't carry Christ in your bosom and all the lusts of this world. You just can't do it. 